Well, it's really exciting to be here and to see some familiar faces, especially some people who were, are in my first book. Uh, the farming, there's some Cortez people here, which is really wonderful. And it's really wonderful to see Mitsuo Yamada, who is a person I cite in this book, and she's also spoken in my class. It's also, and also there's another person who uh, is mentioned in my class, and that is Carlene Koketsu, who is a member of the Adam Mets. So it's very special uh, honor that she's here. I wanted to thank uh, the Japanese American Museum of San Jose and also Como Gavro, who invited me here. Uh, thank you to Steve Fujita, Chris Hioki, Mary Pittman, uh, Eva Yamamoto, and Sharon Kamimoto for making all the arrangements for me and for my books to be here. And uh, I am very grateful to all the Japanese American city girls whose courage and community spirit inspired my book. So I'd like to start by just taking a really, really quick poll. How many of you, and as a child or an adolescent or college age, belong to a youth club? Whether it was the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a sorority, a fraternity, math club, science club, uh, a sports uh, team, um, or uh, any other kind of uh, our church youth group? Anybody? Okay, so you are all, almost all of you are part of a very rich, uh, you know, history of youth organization in the United States and a part of a history that has been important in the Japanese American community. So, Fumiko Fukuyama Ide always loved to dance and being a member of the Tartanets, a Japanese American girls club sponsored by the YWCA, kept her dance card full in the 1930s. Fumiko grew up in Los Angeles during the Great Depression, sewing her own clothes from discount yardage and used flower sacks and darning her socks to make them last longer. She and her brothers regularly swept clean their immigrant father's hardware store on First Street in Little Tokyo. And on the floor above the hardware store, her mother sewed dresses for the Tomio Company department store. And Fumiko helped by stitching hems and making belts. Now, although she was active in school clubs and editor of the Belmont High School newspaper, as for many urban Nisei, much of her socializing took place within Japanese American circles. She and her fellow Tartanets learned to organize parties with scant resources and became adept at the foxtrot waltz and swing. So this is um, Fumiko. Um, she's right here, and this flowered skirt is one that she made herself. And uh, before, during, and after World War II, youth clubs offered city girls like Fumiko a place of camaraderie and understanding. Today I'm going to talk about the dynamic roles and extensive ethnocultural networks of urban Nisei girls in Southern California. From 1920s and 1930s, they formed clubs as a bulwark against racial discrimination and as a key venue in which they could claim modern femininity, um, American identity, and also public space. Clubs promoted friendship and um, social service, leadership training, while also facilitating the pursuit of courtship and romantic love. And these networks would continue to offer Nisei women fellowship, organizational skills, and recreation during World War II incarceration, as well as helping to reshape the rebuilding of the Japanese American community in the post-war period. By the second decade of the 20th century, Los Angeles had become the major population center of Japanese Americans in the United States. By 1930, there were 35,000 in LA County, and half were second generation US born Nisei. As writer, Nisei writer Joe Oyama, a Bay Area person, observed in 1936, Los Angeles is to the Japanese what Harlem is to the Negro, San Francisco to the Chinese, Stockton to the Filipinos, and Hollywood to the Midwestern girl." End quote. <laughs> Little Tokyo in downtown LA was the hub of the diverse Japanese American communities that took root in parts of Southern California, reflecting patterns of work and residential segregation. Here's another view uh, from Weller Street. And I like the juxtaposition because we can see in the background City Hall and in the foreground the Salvation Army. It's uh, just right, right here. 
Now, the Japanese immigrants, uh, the Issei and their Nisei children, faced a battery of discriminatory laws and quotidian hostility. Ineligible for naturalization, the Issei could not vote. Several Western states, led by California, passed alien land laws to prevent Japanese and other Asians from owning or leasing agricultural land. California also joined a number of Western states in passing miscegenation statutes, barring people of African and Asian descent from marrying whites. Throughout the West, racial housing covenants enforced residential segregation, limiting the areas where people of color and Jews could live. Now, although the Nisei uh, citizens by birth had voting rights and could hold title to land, they were also subject to miscegenation laws and housing covenants, as well as to discrimination in the job market and in public facilities. One Nisei woman journalist, Katsumi Kunitsugu, recalled how movie theaters often restricted Japanese Americans to the poor seats in the balcony and how some restaurants refused them service. She said, you go into just any old restaurant and sometimes the waitresses wouldn't serve you. They don't tell you to get out, they just never came around to take your order. Race relations varied in different districts of Southern California, ranging from inclusive schools such as Roosevelt High School in East LA to less inclusive institutions such as the Pasadena City College. However, most Nisei youth faced the realities of discrimination and exclusion from an early age. Now, because they were often excluded from school clubs and extracurricular activities during the two decades before World War II, many young Japanese Americans turned to their peers for recreation and camaraderie. And this is one of the very early Nisei clubs in Los Angeles' Little Tokyo. This is the um, Oliver Boys. There was also an Oliver Girls branch. Nisei clubs like these spread rapidly along the Pacific Coast in cities such as Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego. In the pre-war period, clubs were mainly an urban phenomenon. City youth were more likely to have free time and access to transportation. Los Angeles, with the largest population of Japanese Americans, boasted the most extensive youth networks. By the eve of World War II, estimates of the number of Nisei youth organizations ranged from 400 to 600, with young women's clubs swelling the number. So why were clubs so appealing to girls and young women? I like this uh, one. I think it's interesting because it shows that there are actually several non Japanese or you know non-Asian women in um, in this group, and I'm guessing that this one might be the club advisor. Now, to understand the appeal of these clubs, it's helpful to keep in mind the childhood and adolescent training of the Nisei. Birth order and gender affected the experiences um, of the Nisei. Older children carried the burden of greater family responsibility. Daughters are usually subject to stricter supervision and had to do domestic chores from which their brothers were exempt. Most of the second generation spoke Japanese with their parents and English with their siblings and also with their friends and their teachers. The Issei admonished their children to study hard and excel in school. They also tried to instill oya koko, which is a sense of filial piety that includes this notion that achievement will bring family honor. Now, the leisure time of girls like Fumiko Fukuyama Ide was subordinate to family responsibilities. Whether they lived on a farm or in the city, Japanese American children provided vital labor. And I know you all know this. City girls were often helping to operate family businesses uh, in the Japanese American enclave, whether they were waiting on uh, tables and, for, and helping restaurant customers or stocking the shelves of grocery stores. In the Sawtell community of West LA, Rose Honda and her sister aided their mother with her pansy nursery. So they were transplanting seedlings and digging up plants for customers. While in seaside Venice, teenager Esther Take Nishio helped her parents with um, their Venice amusement pier concessions. So she was working on weekends in a game booth or as a cashier for the octopus ride. I wish I had a picture of that. 
and girls' chores also included housework and supervising younger siblings. So the Nisei grew up synthesizing the Japanese customs of their parents uh, and American mainstream culture and other ethnic cultural elements, which might range from Chinese food to Mexican piñatas. And they celebrated a mixed round of holidays, including Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, New Year's, Girls' Day, and Boys' Day. So here are, is a Girls' Day celebration. Uh, whoops. Oh, no. That's odd. OK, let's see what's happening here. That's very, very strange. This is a bad sign. Um, well, there was a Girls' Day <laughs> celebration. I do have another USB, but I don't know that it would uh, have better luck than this one. So I hope this is, uh, these are not all the slides that came from the Japanese American National Museum. We shall see. So anyway, um, it was a picture of uh, mothers and daughters who are gathered in a, a family home. And they are, have uh, plates of what looks very delicious and chopsticks. And there is a traditional dolls display in the background. So anyway, you'll have to imagine it. And, and certainly for the Issei and Nisei, city life made both ethnic culture and mainstream leisure culture more accessible, whether it was the movies of Shirley Temple or the movies of Shirley Yamaguchi. Yeah. However, the emergence around the world of the, um, of the modern girl with her bold flapper fashion and pursuit of romantic love caused concern among elders in Little Tokyo as elsewhere in the 1920s and 1930s. Now this is a drawing by Julia Suski, and it appeared in the Rafu Shimpo in 1926, and it illustrates the glamorous allure of modern style while also poking fun at the worries of parents. So I know it's kind of small, but the caption says it's in the form of a dialogue. One young woman says, some terrible things can be caught from kissing. And the second young woman says, I believe it. You ought to see the poor fish our Aggie caught. <laughs> so what Aggie caught was not a social disease, but a lackluster suitor. Now, while urban Japanese American girls may have been more concerned about the latter than the former, they were under pressure to maintain a chaste reputation. Nisei daughters faced more rigorous monitoring than their brothers because girls' behavior was a marker of family respectability and social status within the ethnic community. And this was also the case in the Chinese American and Mexican American communities. As Monica Sone, author of Nisei Daughter, wrote, Japanese American girls found that Issei teachers and community leaders wished to mold them into an ideal Japanese ojo-san, a refined maiden who is quiet, pure in thought, polite, serene, and self-controlled. And a 1939 survey of Issei and Nisei revealed that the majority believed that Nisei boys almost always had more freedom in the home than the girls. So not surprisingly, the social mingling of Nisei girls and boys, especially at dances, became a key area of generational conflict. In both Southern California and Hawaii, Japanese parents' complaints focused mainly on the dress and behavior of girls, reflecting the double standard for sons and daughters. And the Issei and their children disagreed over allowing mixed-sex youth activities, as well as clashing over who should make decisions regarding Nisei marriage. So given the pressures they encountered within and outside the ethnic community, Nisei girls and young women found much needed acceptance and peer group understanding in a wide array of urban Japanese American organizations. Chaperoned club activities were more likely to win approval from strict immigrant parents. Barred from taking part in many of the social activities of the majority culture, the Nisei by the 1930s had established a broad network of organizations within their ethnic communities. So the earliest girls club photo I could find was uh, Chi Alpha Delta, which was the first Asian American sorority. And here they are in front of the Ambassador Hotel and the famous Coconut Grove nightclub. Students of color were denied admission to college sororities and fraternities. Because they were excluded from the Greek system and from housing at UCLA, a group of Nisei women established Chi Alpha Delta, which was chartered in 1929. 
Like the African-American sororities and fraternities, these Nisei students created their own space of belonging and peer support. Chi Alpha Delta exemplifies the significance of these ethnic youth clubs, both as a refuge from racial exclusion and as a vehicle that enabled young women to develop leadership skills and to socialize with young men, who were also usually club members. In this case, they were often the Nisei Bruins from UCLA or the Nisei Trojans from USC. Now, both Christian and Buddhist churches fostered girls, boys, and co-ed clubs, not to mention the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. But YWCA-sponsored activities were particularly widespread. The YWCA tried to include racial minority girls, but without challenging racial lines by establishing <coughs> segregated branches in ethnic communities. So I want to point out, this is the back of a, a very tiny membership card from a Nisei girl from before the war. And um, you will notice that it has the World Council, the LA YWCA, there's a Hollywood branch, there's a 12th Street branch for Negro women and girls, and here is the Japanese <coughs> branch. So I thought that was really interesting. I'd never seen this. Uh, this was something that somebody brought to my last talk, actually, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so that was very interesting, this uh, notion of the segregated branches. And starting in 1918, the YWCA's Girl Reserves Clubs which targeted junior high and high school girls proved especially appealing. Now, one of the numerous young Nisei who joined the Girl Reserves was Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga. And uh, here's Aiko. She is, uh, this is, uh, Aiko is the second from the left. And uh, Aiko recalled, having joined a group of other girls in the neighborhood to form a social club, the Junior Misses, gave us girls opportunities and excuses to get together with the Nisei Boys Clubs. <laughs> and here they are the junior misses uh, uh, at uh, El Segundo Beach. And Aiko's not in this picture because she was the club uh, photographer, so she took all the pictures. She noted, the girls' clubs had names such as the debutantes and Queen Esthers, while the boys' clubs were named Mustangs, Knights, and other manly names. We, we held volleyball, baseball games, and held dances to get to know the boys." End quote. So her Issei parents disapproved of single couples dating, but they allowed her to socialize with other young men and women in group activities. Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga's memories of childhood and adolescence, like those of many second-generation Japanese Americans in Southern California, reflect pre-war racial boundaries. Although most of her classmates were European American, her friends were Japanese American. She said, my days at Los Angeles High School were, on the whole, a good experience, despite a feeling, on my part at least, of not being truly a part of the primarily white student body population." End quote. Now, Aiko and other Nisei found warm welcome in ethnocultural youth organizations. The Nisei groups enabled the second generation to take part in a wide range of recreational activities, some that were for girls only and others that were co-ed. Picnics and beach outings were a staple for the Southern California clubs. Club outings also introduced Nisei girls to local cultural institutions, such as the Southwest Museum in Pasadena, with which few of their parents were familiar or had leisure time to visit. And girls also visited local businesses. For example, in August of 1926, the SOF Girl Reserves and their sponsor took an educational tour of the Alfred Ice Cream Company on 18th Street. One happy girl reserve reported, Pop took us on a tour of the plant. He showed us how they made Eskimo pies, sundaes, bricks, and last but not least, ice cream. When the tour was ended, the man presented each of us with two Eskimo pies. So buoyed by this experience, she concluded, we expect to go on more educational tours in the future. <laughs> Girls also enjoyed club sports. Basketball and baseball teams abounded for all ages and drew enthusiastic crowds. Sports not only brought Japanese American youth together, but also introduced them to other racial ethnic athletes. 
Uh, so in addition to Nisei League competition, girls also played against Russian American and African American YWCA teams. By 1939, the Japanese American Women's Athletic Union, which was the counterpoint to a boys' Japanese athletic union, boasted a membership of nearly 500 women. Clubs also gave young women and men opportunities to enjoy one of, oh, these are all the museum photos that are not coming up. Do you want to try the other USB? I don't know that it's going to be better. But I'm noticing that's all the images from Janum that are not showing up. I do. Sorry about this. This is really disconcerting. Sorry about that. This is, uh, thank you for being flexible. Um, anyway, this is a great picture of Patrick and Lily Okura dancing instead at Nisei Week in 1938. And the Ise and Nisei held very different views about dancing, as was reflected in a 1929 column in the Rafu Shimpo that they were defining dance. And they said, to the first generation, dance is hugging set to music. <laughs> But to the second generation, dance is the highest type of social interaction. By 1936, journalist Bill Hosokawa declared, quote, not more than half a decade ago, dancing was looked upon as next to sin by many of the first generation. But times doth change. Any young person now that doesn't dance is practically a social outcast. Both girls' clubs and boys' clubs organized dances, which were usually chaperoned by club advisors. Now, in addition to their social functions, many of the Nisei organizations had a social service component. So, as an example, in 1933, the Cherry Blossom Girls Club purchased fabric and made nightgowns for orphans at the Japanese children's home. And young women's clubs regularly collected toys and food for the needy families at holiday time. Even their recreational um, activities offered opportunities for social service, as in 1932, when the Blue Triangle Club held a cabaret-style benefit dance, promising waltz and foxtrot contests. Mm -hmm. Although it was their main focus, the Nisei did not limit their social service efforts to the Japanese-American community. Uh, for example, in 1934, Issei and Nisei musicians and dancers performed in a Little Tokyo benefit program to raise funds for the LA Philharmonic Orchestra. During the program intermission, the Rafu Shimpo announced, 40 girls dressed in beautiful kimonos would dance down the aisles performing various ondo. Nisei girls more than boys were expected to represent the ethnic community at school festivals and civic events. Um, and this was often orchestrated through clubs. Again, this is not going to work, but um, you will have to imagine. <laughs> Sorry. You'll have to imagine this uh, image of the Emba Girl Reserves Club and the Japanese club. Uh, these are girls, teenage girls wearing kimono in the Japanese Garden of Roosevelt High School uh, in East LA on International Day in 1940. So, Girls are often called upon to represent the community, taking off their regular clothes, putting on kimono. They usually serve tea or perform traditional Japanese songs and dances. Now, on the one hand, we might view these performances as an affirmation of immigrant uh, ethnic culture. But on the other hand, they also illustrate how the Nisei were often typecast as exotic and foreign, rather than recognized as homegrown Americans. And this complex role was a striking contrast to the modern girl, right? And it reinforced stereotypes, uh, and it made Nisei daughters increasingly uncomfortable as war approached. So I'm afraid that all the next slides, rats. OK, then there was a picture of them in their street clothes. They look quite different. Nisei girls in kimono also became part of long-term efforts to attract both Japanese American and mainstream customers to Little Tokyo. Young women's club members provided support for the Nisei Week Festival initiated by Issei merchants in 1934. Nisei women served as the welcoming face of the ethnic community. Wearing kimono, they greeted and served tea to visitors, competed in the Nisei Week Queen contest, walked the runway in fashion shows, and performed as musicians, singers, and dancers. Um, and uh, so, alas, yes, uh, 
there was a, a photo, this, is the, uh, this was an unusual photo because it was the Japanese American community's first and last float that appeared in the Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade. It was January 1st, 1941. And the queen and two of her princesses were wearing Western gowns and two were wearing kimono. It's a very interesting image. Um, oh, here's an image that you can see. Whoops. <laughs> okay, now youth groups also facilitated Nisei engagement with popular culture in a range of ways. For example, here again is Aiko Herzog Yoshinaga, right here. Her childhood dream was to be a dancer. City girls like Aiko were more likely to be able to take classes to hone skills popularized by stars such as Shirley Temple and Ginger Rogers. Uh, so here she is in the Nisei troupe of the Dave King and May Murray Studios around 1936. And this group performed tap dance, ballet, and folk dance at local movie theaters between movie reels. Now, as this photo suggests, a wide array of Nisei organizations abounded in Los Angeles. In addition to the girls and boys clubs and athletic leagues, there were arts organizations such as a symphony orchestra, the Harmony Club for musicians, dancers, and singers, and a theater group called the Little Tokyo Players. Aspiring Nisei actors took part in numerous youth club uh, and church-sponsored plays. So this is a really, really rare photo. It's water damaged, but at the center we have a teenage Setsuko Matsunaga Nishi, who would be, later become a famous sociologist, and she is uh, starring in this drama that was staged at the Union Church in LA, and it was direct, the play was directed by Maki Ichiasu, who was the head of the Japanese YWCA. And this is around 1939. And Setsuko Nishi is playing a mother whose two sons were fighting on opposite sides in a war. And you can see one son on one side. The broad range of arts activities reflects the vitality of Nisei creativity in the pre-war community. One of the best documented organizations was the Nisei Writers Group, whose members aimed to develop a distinctive second generation voice. Women played dynamic roles in forging this literary network that by 1940 spanned the country and the Pacific Ocean. Mary Oyama Mitwer, um, who is here visiting UCLA, uh, she was born in 1907 and she provides a key example. Mary grew up in a very talented and enterprising family. Her immigrant father, who had worked as a gold miner, a plantation laborer in Hawaii, and a peddler of tamales, started the first Japanese-owned cosmetics company in the United States. Mary, the oldest of six children, graduated from Sacramento High School in 1925 and then attended the Methodist Girls Training School in San Francisco. After serving as a social worker in Spokane, Washington, she migrated south in the early 1930s to rejoin her family, who had settled in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, Mary continued to work with Nisei youth clubs while developing as a prolific writer for Japanese American newspapers across the state. Now as the Japanese, I mean, as the English language sections of the ethnic press reveal, Mary was a poet, a fiction writer, an editor, an essayist, and an advice columnist. She was a leading light of the Nisei literati who often gathered at her home. Uh, an energetic organizer, Mary would have loved social media. She was not only interested in fostering Nisei talent, but also in advancing interracial communication. Indeed, she initiated correspondence with writers she admired, such as F. Scott Fitzgerald and African-American writer Chester Himes, who became a friend. In fact, Chester Himes and his wife Jean spent the war years in the Oyama Mitwer home in East LA. During the bleak years of World War II uprooting and incarceration, Nisei youth groups continued to constitute an important outlet, organizing sports and dances and bolstering morale. And the YWCA clubs and the Girl Scouts were very active in the confinement camps. This photo shows two girl reserves, and you can see the girl reserves insignia on their sleeves. Uh, and they are displaying victory dolls in the Amachi camp in Colorado. 
Now each of these dolls was dressed by one of the girl reserves clubs in the camp. Uh, and they were to depict women's work in the war effort. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a display at a uh, camp arts and crafts festival. So I think this is very interesting that the most prominent label for the doll is Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> you can also see there's a nurse on the end. Um, I also had an image, sorry you can't see it, of uh, the, a Girl Scout troop from the rower camp. And uh, they were posing in front of their barrack, which, uh, clubhouse, which was this converted barrack, uh, where they were singing and holding meetings on Saturdays. So. Well, sorry. Yes, alas, there was a nice picture of Yuri too. Young second generation women played crucial roles in reviving pre-war groups and shepherding new ones in the camps. Esther Takenishia was one of the Nisei who stepped in as a club advisor for younger girls. Um, with, together with a friend she met while waitressing in Santa Anita Assembly Center, um, and while they were in Colorado, they helped organize a group called the Jodies. This is a YWCA Girl Reserves group. Um, they, but then um, Esther and her friend also held block dances and they started a theater group. And um, Esther and Aki also began a club for young women of their own age. So after, as before the war, club events facilitated co-ed socializing. Esther recalled, oh, I think our main activity was to have a dance so we could meet the guys, end quote. <coughs> Club activities could also offer girls an opportunity to participate in the war effort. Before the war, Yuri Kochiyama had volunteered with the Girl Scouts, the YWCA, and a settlement house. And in the Santa Anita Assembly Center, she was teaching Sunday school, mostly for junior high school girls, and she established the Crusaders Girls Club. She said, while waiting to be relocated to the internment camps, I wanted to do something to help the war effort and our boys in the service especially when I found out that several of my students had brothers in the military. I thought it would be a good idea to write to them. So this group grew as older teenage girls flocked to join. Beginning with penny postcards, the Crusaders exchanged thousands of letters with soldiers overseas. Kochiyama recalled, our list of soldiers to write grew larger to 1,300, and even when we were split up to be transferred to different camps, we all promised to continue the work of the Crusaders wherever we were." End quote. And Nisei soldiers, especially men in the 232nd Engineers, who were part of the 442nd <coughs> Regimental Combat Team, responded enthusiastically, sending contributions from the front lines that <coughs> enabled these girls to switch from mailing postcards to letters in two-cent envelopes. So I also want to point out that there's a very exciting display downstairs of the Crusaders' letters to and from these soldiers. It was very exciting to see that. So I encourage you to go, if you haven't seen that, take a look. It's very moving. For the younger incarcerated Nisei, the revival of youth organizations like the Girl Scouts and the Crusaders may have played a key role in keeping alive a sense of belonging. And like earlier girls' clubs, offering young women a way to demonstrate American identity. Yuri Kochiyama's efforts as a crusader did not end with the war. Her girls' club organizing in the Santa Anita Assembly Center in the Jerome camp in Arkansas were ju was just the start. After her fiance, Bill Kochiyama, who was a soldier in the 442nd, returned from Europe, Yuri reunited with him in New York, where they married and raised their family in Harlem. Both of them became lifelong civil rights activists. Yuri joined the organization of Afro-American Unity and became a friend of Malcolm X. She was involved in the movement um, to end the war in Vietnam. And here she is speaking at a, an anti-war <coughs> rally in 1968. She also became active in the Asian American movement. And uh, Yuri died on June 1st, 2014 at the age of 93. Now, while Yuri Kochiyama moved east after the war, the majority of Japanese Americans hoped to rebuild their lives in the West. One of the very first to test the waters was Esther Takei Nishio, who returned to California from the Amachi camp in 1944. Okay, this is before the exclusion of Japanese Americans from the West Coast 
ended in 1945. She is one of the Nisei women who paved the way for the return of Japanese Americans to the West, where intense anti-Japanese hostility lingered. Even though the Army had allowed a number of Nisei women to return to California before September 1944, local newspapers singled out Esther Takei as the first to come back to the Los Angeles region. In the summer of 1944, Hugh Anderson, a Quaker auditor and civil rights leader from Pasadena, visited Esther and her parents in Amachi. After first securing permission from Major General Charles Bonesteel, who was then head of the Western Defense Command, Anderson asked her to return to California to attend Pasadena Junior College and invited her to stay with his family. Esther arrived after a three-day train trip, and here she is arriving. Uh, and being greeted at the station, Hugh Anderson is also in this picture. Uh, and uh, she said that she felt a great mixture of trepidation and joy at return. Then, as Hugh Anderson put it, all hell broke loose in Pasadena. Groups such as the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Native Sons and Daughters of the Golden West, and the American Legion heatedly protested her arrival. The Pasadena and Los Angeles newspapers fanned the flames of public furor. And the Anderson family and the college president were barraged by threatening phone calls. However, at the same time, groups such as the NAACP, the Friends of the American Way, uh, an array of churches, and prominent scholars like biochemist Linus Pauling offered support to Esther and the Andersons. When the controversy grew most intense, Critical help came from a student group called the AMVETS. This is an organization of veterans who had fought in the South Pacific. So this group escorted Esther from class to class to protect her. And their support, their visible support, helped to turn the tide of public opinion in Pasadena. She also received support and encouragement from Nisei veterans um, of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In addition to the stress of being a 19-year-old freshman adjusting to the demands of college coursework, not to mention the transition from life in camp, Esther soldiered on under enormous pressure. Just as the Nisei had been expected to represent their families and communities to the larger society before the war, Esther and other carefully selected early returnees knew that on their shoulders rested the hopes of thousands still behind barbed wire or scattered across the Midwest and East. As in the 1920s and 30s, during the war, young Nisei women served as appealing, non-threatening home front representatives of the larger ethnic community. According to Hugh Anderson, Esther's successful return proved instrumental in convincing General Bonesteel to rescind the mass exclusion of Japanese Americans from the West Coast earlier than expected. For Esther Takenishio, Yuri Kochiyama, and most Japanese Americans, the return to the West Coast and the end of the war presented continuing challenges. They faced housing and job discrimination, vigilante violence, and harassment, compounded by a housing shortage and a swelling labor force. And Again, as many of you know, it's, hard to, it's impossible to emphasize how difficult it was for them to restart their lives in this climate of persisting racial animosity. So amid the disruptions of resettlement, clubs and informal peer networks offered vital support to Nisei youth facing hostility in post-war Southern California. By 1950, there were some 200 Nisei youth clubs in the Southland, and again, young women's organizations were particularly numerous. I don't know that this is going to come out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hooray. Okay, now some of these clubs had formed in the camps. So, for example, the Jugs, which stood for Just Us Girls, had, they started when they were about 12. Uh, they had begun in Manzanar, and they continued to enjoy sports and dancing after resettlement. Uh, so here they are in Boyle Heights. Yes, in East LA. The formation of new Nisei clubs also reflected the importance of peer understanding and recreational opportunities. I don't think this is, ah, sorry. 
we'll, we'll just continue looking at the JAGs. Uh, the formation of new Nisei clubs also reflected the importance of peer understanding and recreational opportunities. Rose Honda and Mary Ishizuka were two of the young adults who stepped in to serve as advisors. Two younger Nisei girls in the lively Adamets club, comprised of seven sixth graders in Rose's Sunday school class at the West Los Angeles United Methodist Church. And the club grew out of Rose's sense of the need for positive activities for the girls whose families were preoccupied with the struggle to find work. Rose recalled that the atom bomb was in the news, and here were these young girls who were in their very young teens, just as energetic and explosive for bridge fiends, ping pong fans, the parlor game crowd, and dance lovers. Service. After they married and had children, they called themselves Mrs. Personas, and they took part in a new array of Japanese American community activities. Nisei women continue to cherish the club ties they formed when they were girls. The lively jugs still meet regularly to play poker, and they go to Las Vegas together once a year. The Adamettes are now working on a book of their photos and memories and celebrating more than six decades of friendship. They have not only supported each other through thick and thin, but have also transformed community practices and institutions. In conclusion, from the pre-war years to the post-war period, Japanese American women's ethnocultural organizational affinities facilitated their claiming modern American femininity as well as their formation of places of acceptance and support, um, providing a foundation for their later work in social, service, political, and religious groups within and outside the ethnic community. Women's involvement in all arenas um, of the post-war Japanese American redress movement of the 1970s and 80s, from grassroots mobilization and educational outreach to congressional lobbying and the implementation of the redress program serves as a notable example. Aiko, Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga, the Girl Reserves Club member and tap dancer I mentioned earlier, became a renowned leader in the redress movement. So here she is with other redress activists. Here's Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, Michi Wegland, Bill Horry, here's Aiko and Harry Ueno standing in front of the Supreme Court. The imprint of Nisei women's organizational drive and experience endures in the legacies of this campaign and in the community activities of succeeding generations. Thank you. <laughs> I would also really, um, Paul Okimoto, author, thank you for coming. And I also would like to acknowledge Carleen Koketsu. We have an Adamette here. And I was hoping you would just say a few words about being in the Adamettes. Well, we were very fortunate to have Rose and, and Mary as our advisors because they did uh, help us to a lot of activities and, and service was very important. Many of us have continued with volunteering, and uh, we're getting together in June. Uh, the, those of us who are left, <laughs> and um, we're in, in June we're getting together, and that will be fun. We lost Mary a yeah. few years ago. Yeah. But we used to occasionally get together. Well, not occasionally. We for about 25 years, we got together at, at uh, um, a civil mar. And several of us got together our fam with our families. Do you have any favorite activities of all those things that you did with the Adamettes? Which things do you, do you remember the most? Um, let's see. We used to be able to go to concerts. They took us to concerts, museums. <coughs> Very far, but it's fun. But this book that is being put together, um, we're hoping that it will be printed by the end of the year. 
Yes. I'm really looking forward to this book because I have seen their memorabilia. They even have a recording of themselves singing when they were about 12. <laughs> and, they've, uh, and, and they have amazing pictures and, uh, and you're all writing essays to go along with it. So, so uh, this is, uh, we're all awaiting this book in West LA. Uh, so we can learn more about the adventures of the Adamettes. So, does anybody else have any club uh, memories or questions or comments? Are you all really tired? <laughs> yeah. I have a question that's uh, not related directly to the clubs thing, but in, in your book you talk about the uh, transition from the Issei to the Niseis in terms of arranged marriage versus uh, romantic choice thing. Mm -hmm. Um, what sort of uh, jogged my memory about that was uh, my mom always and father always used to portray themselves as kind of romantically mm -hmm. selecting each other. They worked for a Japanese grocery store. But I heard my aunt say uh, when they weren't around <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you know they were one of these couples that had to get married be, uh, so they could stay together to go to camp together. Yeah. So they rushed the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And she said that the grandfather rushed around to get a baishakunin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's the first time it ever occurred to me that baishakunin was kind of a cultural necessity that wasn't strictly... Go between. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't strictly yeah. functional. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, what's your thought about how the, the whole thing about... The baishakunin? Baishakunin and how Nisei looked at it and uh, if you compare it to Japan over the same time period, what's happened there mm -hmm. to the... I've asked my friends, Japan scholars, and they actually, have, it's been hard to find out about the baishakunin. They all say, oh, that would be a really interesting research topic. Um, but, um, and it's very interesting because, for example, in the farm country, like in Cortez, there were, there were some uh, arranged marriages before the war. You certainly don't see as many arranged marriages anywhere after the war. Um, but um, what I've seen, I've seen some... Um, there were some students at USC who were doing sociological research before the war in the 20s and 30s, and they, a lot of them were studying ethnic communities. And there's some very interesting material, actually, and they were surveying youth and their parents. And, uh, and actually, it's interesting, because if you look at the pre-war newspapers, you do see that um, the early marriages that are announced, there's usually, they also give, they give the name of the couple and the f families, and then they mention who the baishakuning are. These are the, maybe the, the go-betweens or the, the sort of matchmakers. It's kind of hard to define it. But um, it seems like it's kind of a ceremonial role, and it becomes increasingly ceremonial because um, there were these uh, things that people, comments that people made in the surveys and also um, in the newspaper, their little jabs that um, made it sound as though it, by the time we get close to the war that not everybody has these baishakuning, but if they do, it's after the fact. The couple makes their own choice and then they have some family friends who are stepping in, you know, for the sort of a ceremonial role. So I don't know, do you know anything about this, Meet Sue? No, I don't. Um, I thought that, that's kind of turned around. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, the Baishakuni, uh, the people, my, my, my dad and mom used to do that become for couples. And you know, they arranged it first. So they would introduce them? And they would introduce the couple. They would meet for the first time in a restaurant or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in Steve's mm -hmm. parents' case, if they were already knowing each other, what was their role as Baishakuni? Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's why said, she said it's just a ceremonial. This is the title. Yeah. They don't do anything at the wedding. Or I don't know. They, they uh. just, well, sometimes, well, my, you know, my mom, of course, that was in Japan. But, you know, they met for the first time at a restaurant when they had a meeting. Did that by Shakunin introduce them? And my dad was much shorter, remember, than mom? So I remember Joe asking mom, why did you marry such a short man? <laughs> <laughs> he was a teenager and all his friends were growing. And, he was down there. and my mom said, well, you know, when they got to the restaurant first and they were all sitting there, so she said, I didn't know he was so short because he didn't stand up until after the engagement. <laughs> 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 <The> strategy. <laughs> I still resent that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom was about a half head 
taller than my oh, dad. Oh, wow. And that's why he was saying, why did you marry such a short guy? <laughs> I didn't know she was so short. <laughs> but even if she had known, I don't know that she would have been able to really, you know, uh, have any yeah, say if the family really surveyed. Yeah. Met, yeah. Yeah. So, so, but that's a great family story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were certainly arranged marriages, but I think that by the war, it is the Baishakuning are more ceremonial. And 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 uh, and they weren't, you know, but there was probably a mixture some uh, of of cases. Um, but it, you certainly, and then you don't see them mentioned at all after that. Well, I guess they say what they're, they, what they were trying to do is to simply replicate what has happened in their own experience and then kind of impose it on the Nisei. But the Nisei usually wouldn't have any of it, they, you know. But and then the Issei stepped in and they tried to impose the Japanese custom of Baisakuni on them and then they went through the motion, you know of what it was. It's kind of, that's kind of an interesting idea, I guess. Were your parents ever approached by young people who wanted to meet somebody who were having trouble and asking yeah, for their help? Uh, my dad was a, a community leader in the, in, and they were always approached by the parents of oh, the young people oh. to, to be a for the couple. I oh. see. So they had, that was a role for them? I mean, Yeah, that's it. I guess that's oh. kind of a ceremony. I didn't role. realize that. Actually, um, the Abicos, you know, who founded the Cortez and Livingston colonies, they were also very prominent and often, and they also sometimes acted as Baishakuni or to introduce people. Oh, that was something that. I knew that they. Yeah, so I, I have these group pictures of, you know, weddings of people oh. I don't even know because their parents are in it. Oh, you know, because, because they, they were, were the Baishakuni. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Did people ever, if the marriage like ran into problems, w would they go to your parents for advice? I mean, was that part of the Baishakuni role? No. No. Marriage counseling. Yeah, I just wondered, you know. I've never heard of that. Okay. When they got married, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I have, a, I have a question, and because I just never thought of this, what you're saying, I haven't read your book yet, but about the role of these clubs with the Nisei women before the war, during the war, and then after the war, and how they played a role in, I assume, structuring a lot of the social activities that you know, Sansei participated in youth clubs, things connected to the churches. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you, um, if you talk at all about the relation to the Nisei men. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I have to apologize ahead of time. As a Sansei, I have a certain stereotype of Nisei women, Nisei men. And so the women are organizing all the social stuff. They're like the glue. Yeah. Then the Nisei men, of course, are in charge, and they do certain logistical things. So I'm not sure if that was really true in the restructuring of all of the social organizations, I mean, what the well, she, relation she between the men and the women. She doesn't have any pictures of the Nisei men when they were kids. Mm. And the only pictures I have of my brothers are at Kendo, Judo, Kai, you know, when group, group pictures of them yeah. at, at a Kendo tournament. Yeah. Or, mm. So, so, mm -hmm. so what, I'm, what I'm interested mm -hmm. in is like, what was, I mean, did mm -hmm. the men, what kind of role they played in shaping these organizations? And then what mm -hmm. role were the women after the war? You know, after the war, you know, like okay. The I mean, all these different clubs that I've, you know, I've just come to accept as just being there forever. So the boys didn't have any social clubs? No, they had, they had tons, but the girls' clubs were just more numerous. But there were lots, there were like, well, you, if their estimates are between 400 and 600 Nisei youth clubs in Southern California before the war, and a lot of those were also boys. A lot of them were athletic leagues, That's what I was actually. The boys, it was sports. But the, uh, the Oliver boys who I showed were one of the early ones, and they, they were also holding dances and things like that. The boys clubs tended to be more focused on sports, sports. but they were, you know, they were certainly very active, and, um, and actually there were, um, because uh, there was still a lot of hostility after the war, there was a resurgence of, of clubs, and some of them became a little bit more multi-ethnic, but, but the Nisei did kind of band together, the younger, like the older Sansei and the ni younger Nisei, and actually I've, um, I was, yeah, those, those uh, sports also. But I've talked to people who told me about their clubs in the 50s, you know, and they were, um, like for example, I think, I think it was Belmont, but I'm sure, not sure this, uh, uh, Roy Imazu in the Valley was telling me, he was, a man, there were three clubs, there was a girls club that was, uh, had a, he said a sorority sounding name, so it was a Greek letter, and then there were two boys clubs, that one was the Wombats and the other was the Cardiacs, and he was, he was, <laughs> the Cardiacs spelled with a K, and he was a Cardiac, so, and, um, and so actually there were quite a lot, and the Japanese American National Museum has a collection of, somebody gave all these um, club cards and dance cards to the museum from the 50s, 
And so there are all these groups with very different names from the pre-war ones. They're not affiliated with the YWCA and the YMCA. They're, mm -hmm. and they're they have names like the Christels, and they sound like you know music groups. And and they were having all kinds of parties and dances. And so the <laughs> boys also had those. I mean, they were they were clearly interested in socializing. And clubs are the way to have you know a, a peer group that you you know had your back, and also to be able to socialize and to be sort of. Uh, um, thought of as respectable within the community. So I was just wondering if there was a, that relationship between the, the Nisei men and Nisei women in shaping these groups, what kind of dynamic there was, or if that was already pretty much set up before. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, because things changed a lot, of course, after yeah. the war in this community. So. Well, you also have what's happening in the larger society, right? And the whole notion of suburbia and the suburban family and the little leave it to beaver and father knows best and, you know, all those kinds of images. And um, there's this big push, right, to focus on the nuclear family. So, you know, Japanese Americans are trying really hard to fit in and to be accepted and they, they you know, they're have the specter of the camps is looming pretty heavily over them. So I think that, um, you know, I'm sure that, that, yes, of course, they're also being shaped by those ideas as well. And it is a very much, you know, there are these different notions of what women do and men do within uh, the family. But I think the Japanese American women were certainly very key, but men were also doing organizing. They, they, I think it's amazing how quickly they rebuilt a lot of the organizational structure after the war. I think that the pre-war organizations really provide clues to that because these kids knew how to, they knew how to organize anything. They could, they knew how to do fundraising. They all had to, they rotated the offices. So everybody got to be secretary. We got, had to do all these, everybody had to be the treasurer, take a turn. And so, you know, they were pretty good at public speaking. And um, so I think that all those kinds of skills were very useful to them after the war, especially since the Nisei were pushed to become leaders rather early, right? as a Issei being disenfranchised, so I don't know. But you may have more thoughts about that. Susan? Um, you mentioned several times in your talk, you said that the, the, one of the uh, big functions of these clubs was helping Nisei girls and women to claim modern American femininity. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether uh, you're mostly referring to like getting out from under the thumb of their Issei parents and you know, having a more independent existence, or, uh, uh, or did you were you talking more about, um, you know, being more assertive and more less Japanese? And you know what I mean. Mm -hmm, like, I would say that partly it was uh, because they were able to participate in uh, not only in the fashions and the fads and the and the certain the recreations that were really part of mainstream youth and youth culture, but all, um, that um, because within the club structure that um, that was an approved structure it was sanctioned and it was chaperoned, and so they were able to experiment more. And that they, I think that yes, they did have more independence, or they were able to actually the the clubs gave them a vehicle to negotiate mm -hmm. with the Issei, so that they could have the activities they wanted to have. They could, you know, uh, the boys and the girls could socialize together, and um, and also and they were go going to dances and wearing gowns and things like that. So that um, I would say that. Um, part of that modern American femininity were sort of the outward attributes of that modern girl, like as in Louis Suski drawing, uh, and they certainly loved those fashions, the urban girls, but um, it was also about uh, being able to negotiate and to have access to more activities and you know opportunities. And if they did it in a club, in their, then they were more likely to get parental approval. So uh, remember that they all had advisors, the clubs, but these club advisors were also Nisei usually, and they were only a few years older mm -hmm. than the girls or the boys that they were advising. And in fact, there were you know little diatribes occasionally in the Rafu Shimpo before the war saying, you know, people railing about the advisors not being, you know, quite strict enough or not, you know, <laughs> supervising enough and you know, or being too close to the, you know, the, the, the kids and not riding herd on them enough. And I would say that's probably because they were very much in tune with them and so they probably were more lenient perhaps than you know than than the parents might have expected do you think, uh, do you think that this is uh, unique or uh, has a particular um, character to it that's different from 
um, other immigrant communities? Because I, I know that there are, uh, so my son has a lot of friends who are the children of immigrants, Asian, and many of them are very dominated by their parents. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, I, I don't see the same thing. Like, it, it, in, in other words, like the Japanese American Nisei experience seems very determined to belong to American society. I mean, like, you know, like, away. yeah, yeah mm -hmm. very determined and very organized <clears throat> about it. Like, you know, so I'm just wondering if, if do you see that as being unique compared to other immigrant communities? Or? Well, that's a really great question. Um, there are a lot of different factors that um, I think um, influenced how the Nisei responded. And one, of course, was this era of discrimination and exclusion. But it was really important to remember that the Japanese American, the Nisei were the largest Asian American second generation mm -hmm. before World War II because of the laws and because of the geopolitics and the gentleman's agreement and all that, that they were far more um, so there were far more Japanese American families and second generation youth than in any of the other early communities. The Chinese Americans and Korean Americans, Filipinos were really, they were smaller communities. So, so they were the, the largest in number and they, were, they therefore had the most extensive networks. Uh, but you can also find these kinds of club formations that Chinese Americans in San Francisco had clubs and they also had the YWCA. And there was a Filipino YW, uh, YMCA in San Francisco. And um, so, uh, and then certainly in Southern California, you can see Chinese American youth also forming uh, sports teams and clubs. They just didn't have as extensive networks. Their numbers are smaller. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, and sometimes these clubs did in fact, uh, you know, have activities. There were uh, sports dances that the Chinese Americans would invite Japanese American youth um, and vice versa. Uh, but it's, um, I think that, uh, so pre, in the pre-war period, there's a certain sort of racial structure within which these youth of color are operating. And then I think that it looks very different, actually, if you're looking in later periods where um, if you certainly after the Cold War, after the Civil Rights Movement, you know, you find that Asian American youth are integrating into all kinds of organizations, even though there's still Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops that are primarily Japanese American, but they may also belong to other groups that are multi-ethnic. So um, their the circles widen in some respects. So um, I don't know if this exactly answers it, but I think that it's important to um, keep in mind that the, the limitations um, that, that sort of become the framework for their formation of these networks and being excluded from uh, many extracurricular activities. So, uh, in reference to what you were saying, uh, is there some similarities with the Jewish American second generation? Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the Jews, you know, who mm -hmm. immigrated here. I think my mm -hmm. because of gen my oldest daughter married a Jewish guy, and they have many similarities. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the same kind of. Assimilating and not wanting to be, you know, stuck with their parents' traditional ways and so forth. Yeah, yeah I think that there was um, certainly there. There are important similarities, and certainly the org They also have a big organizational structure. So um, there was there was that too. Um, but I think the time period and and the the narrowness of their opportunities in a certain period. The fact that they had to kind of create their own networks was uh, really important and the fact that they had the numbers to do it, mm -hmm. right, gave them more latitude. And then of course there's more options for, um, you know, children of color in the post period. Certainly after the civil rights movement that things have changed considerably in terms of, you know, opportunities and options. But some, some of the Nisei I interviewed, their kids have said that they really envied it because they, there's this closeness of the friendship and the strength of these ties that they don't see among their own friends. And there, there was something about that. So maybe there is something kind of special about these Nisei ties, the shared history, the shared generational experience, you know, and the fact that they understood each other in a certain way. So I can see, actually now if you, I look at thinking about the Korean American students who come out of classes, they have also very strong um, generational ties because there's sometimes some you know, uh, differences between the first generation and the second generation. So maybe that we will see some parallel structures. Paul? Uh, 
in, in 1959, I had a lab partner at Berkeley named Barbara Cerny, who was quite, quite possibly the smartest person I ever met. Anyway, she was asked by Jensen. Uh, are you familiar with Jensen, the study he did uh, of uh, children coming out of uh, the camps? Hmm. Um, and he found out, he discovered that the, uh, the kids that came out of camp they, in, in California, they were uh, a whole standard deviation uh, higher than other ethnic groups in California. Hmm. And he thought that, uh, he thought there was uh, some selectivity going on, hmm. uh, that they were just inherently smaller than some other people. Then, uh, then my partner, hmm. my life partner, she, she concluded, though, in doing the analysis uh, of these studies, she concluded that it was, it was ra rather more uh, motivation mm -hmm. that was responsible for the difference and, uh, and where you stood in the social hierarchy in California. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. <clears throat> yeah, her research sounds, uh, or her analysis sounds really great. So, everybody pegged out? Or, yes? Were there any... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were lots of uh, yes because they had a lot of time on their hands and the adults wanted to keep them busy doing something you know positive and you know uh, forward thinking and that would you know to, so yes the Boy Scouts the Girl Scouts uh, the. Uh, and the YWC and YMC were really active in the camps. And sometimes it was people who continued the pre-war groups, but often they formed new ones. And, um, and actually, if you look at the camp newspapers, the Den Show uh, project has put all of the camp newspapers online. They're digitized, so you can look at them. It's really easy. And they're just filled with the activities of clubs. And there's a lot of uh, you know, baseball and basketball, well, especially baseball games, boys and girls. But there's a lot of club news and it, or activities. So yeah, it was something, gave them something to do, like those, um, those girl reserves uh, uh, members that I showed that one slide, and you know, they were doing things, getting together. So, yeah. And this is another speculative question about the uh, role of uh, social networks and on JA identity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nisei's go through the incarceration, and all those networks get, in some ways, reinforced, but then a lot of them, the local ones, get kind of torn apart, right? Because people go to the Midwest and the East and so mm -hmm. forth, and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're not, they're, not, they're not from Hanford or Reedley or Parley or LA mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they have to form new, new J uh, groups. Mm -hmm. So would that make the identity change? Like it could be more general Japanese American as opposed to be more LA or some locally grounded mm -hmm. sense of, of uh, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would think so. Yeah, I mean I would think so because one of the major one of these one of the things you notice from the pre-war newspapers is that, um, for example, the Christian well the Buddhists also did this. But there were a lot of youth conferences. And there were a lot of Christian and Buddhist youth groups. There was a, whether it was a Young Buddhist Association or the Christian Endeavor, you know, and they were, or the Epworth League, which is one that we don't hear about nowadays. And they were, this was a one way that they could get together and meet youth from other parts of the state, you know, and, and um, have, and sightsee. I mean, they would come to San Jose or those people from Northern California go to LA. And actually there were, there were a lot of, you know, kinds of associations. People were meeting and uh, networking across region. Um, so I, I, don't, I think that uh, most people didn't belong to just one group. They often belonged to multiple groups. And um, so I think that, that this would, I think, fit very well with um, you know, later post-war development of maybe a larger Japanese-American sense. But I don't know. That's a good question. That would be uh, good research, too. Yeah. Well, I would be kind of curious as to what it was like in Hawaii, because I think their family life during the war was less disrupted as it was here in mainland. And so that would mean that the parents had more control over their kids so that I guess maybe the kids would not have a reason to form or join groups uh, in Hawaii, whereas I can see it here. 
Actually, they did have clubs. I was looking for photographs for the book, and I was going through all these binders at the Japanese American National Museum in LA. I went through like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images. But you, actually, unfortunately, they don't, they have only, there's only numbers. And you have to then take the numbers, and somebody has to look it up online to find out where, where these pictures were taken and who this you're looking at. And a lot of the club pictures I saw that looked really cool were actually from Hawaii. Yes, and so there were, and also you find complaints. Eileen Tamura has written about the Nisei <clears throat> growing up in Hawaii and, <clears throat> and found that um, she was quoting that, you know, they too had uh, generational conflicts over, particularly over daughters' behavior and dress and, you know, whether Nisei should be allowed to dance. So there were, you know, uh, perhaps it was, I'm sure it was in many ways different, but there were certainly enough common threads that, um, that there were some generational issues going on and that there were clubs there. I don't know, know that there were as many, but there certainly were. So. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to walk right to that. Um, when I was in high school, in 47 through 50, I was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And when we moved there, uh, I went to a, a high school called Hyde Park High School, and there were many Niseis there. Um, and so they've been there for a World War II history yeah. there. But I was wondering, has anybody done any kind of a, an analysis of the social structure of Nisei in teenagers Chicago. in the Chicago. Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, other than in Southern California? Gee, I don't know. Steve, have you seen anything? I was just thinking you know, that uh, who's the, uh, who are the couple in Washington, DW? Oh, Gail and Steve, yeah, Steve Somita yeah, and Gail, Gail Nomura right, on Chicago? Was, that would be great. Uh, in the Midwest, I don't know. Yeah, she, yeah. That's yeah. I don't know. That would be very interesting because Chicago had one of the largest concentrations of uh, Japanese Americans, you know, and many stayed. But I don't know. I know that I know they had clubs too, actually, because I've seen their photographs also at the museum. Uh, I don't know anything Chicago? about them. Yeah, yeah. There were there were a, a number of them because they're. Uh, and then they donated their photos. Some of them came, families came back. Many of them were from LA, and then some of them didn't come back. But yeah, but there was a big community in Chicago, yeah. so that would be very, very interesting yeah, because, to see. In my high school, there must have been at least 200, 300 nieces mm -hmm. that you know, had just come out of the camps, mm -hmm. and uh, for some reason, I, I never got involved with. with there were half a dozen uh, social clubs, uh -huh. not athletic or any, mm -hmm. you know, these are just social clubs for yeah. boys and girls. Ah, okay. So I, it, it, that I, makes I, and I never knew anything about it, that's so why I was interested in whether somebody might have actually yeah. done a social analysis or something. Like that. I don't know, I don't think so, not that I've heard of. But maybe buried in Setsuko Nishi's material, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that would, it would be a great topic, though. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, Susan. Uh, I was just wondering if you looked at uh, uh, social clubs or or clubs that had to do with um, learning Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, was that a part of mm -hmm. these groups also, like learning how to dance or learning mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Well, there were actually, you know, that's the part of the urban thing is that there were actually, there's access to so much both mainstream and ethnic culture. So a lot of girls were taking piano, and boys too, piano lessons are the dreaded piano lessons, as one of them put it. And, uh, and, but they were also learning koto and shamisen and, and uh, dance, odori classes. Uh, so I don't know I would call those clubs, but certainly there were, and some really enjoyed it and some of them didn't, but there was kind of a range. Um, and they were also learning tap dance, so you know again the the wide range of opportunities. But there were specific clubs that were focusing more on Japanese culture. So there was a group, girls group called the Sumire Kai, which means the Violets Club, and they actually vowed that they would only speak Japanese at their meetings because they, they could practice. 
that was their vow. I don't know if they how long they did that, but they there were but there were a number of them that were trying to learn. They would say, "We will learn Japanese etiquette," and you know, and the Rafushipo would have these little snippets of information about clubs based on what they sent in. And so, uh, so I know that. And then, and then, for example, some of the clubs would decide they would try to learn cooking of different, you know, cultures. And so often they would want to learn Japanese cooking and Chinese cooking and Italian cooking or something like that. So, so there were these aspects that they were interested in. So, and, and I'm sure that their parents encouraged them to focus on that Japanese <laughs> etiquette, right? So, and they did. And they did. Uh, the YWCA and YMCA groups often did a mother mother daughter annual mother daughter events and father son events so those also emphasized culture so neither did you belong to clubs did you no we, i went to cleveland high school in seattle and i think there were well i have a picture by the way of when i saw the son saw the international day mm -hmm. i had two friends japanese friends friends and we got dressed up in a Japanese dress, but there were only three of us mm -hmm. in the whole, practically in the whole school, in Cleveland High School. Cleveland High School is kind of out, what, what is it, out south side? Mm -hmm. Or right outside of, it's in Seattle. It was south, and I think we were the first, they kind of redistricted the area. And I think our older brother went to Franklin High School where there were mm -hmm. a lot of Nisei's. Mm -hmm. and, and my, it, my uh, older brother and I went to Cleveland High School, and there were only about ten of us in the whole school. And, and I have a picture of us in really? on International Day, really wearing a Japanese wow. uniform, wow. three, three Nisei girls. Mm -hmm. But I think we were the only three Nisei girls in the whole school. Mm -hmm. but you can have that picture. I'd love to. How do I'd love a copy of it? How did you How did you feel about that when you? When you oh, I thought it was fun. So was. Did the other kids come dressed in various things too? Uh, international, yeah, right, right. It was a, and um, and then I remember, and then I, I also have a picture of us in a, in a, the same girls, you know, in a, uh, on Fourth of July, Japanese Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. float, you know that. Oh. Yeah, so you could have that too. All right. <laughs> Yay! Research. This yeah, is yeah, great. Yeah. That's great. Um, that, so, did you um, did you take odori or things like yeah, that? Yeah, I went to Hatsunekai, which was a dance school. Oh. <clears throat> for a while. Yeah. So, were you one of those girls who was going out and performing? Well, and my, you know, the, the thing is, my brothers. I have two older brothers, and Joe was the younger brother. I was the only one, one among the four of us who was born in Japan, oh. and I could not become an American citizen, right? Mm -hmm. And so, my <clears throat> when I was about nine, my parents decided. You know, I went to school and I was no longer speaking Jap. You know how it is, and not becoming a Amer too Americanized, and so they, they, she sent me back to Japan to go to school, and learn odori and ikebana, the tea ceremony, you know, all, oh. of these, all of these things. Thank you so very much for inviting me. It's been really wonderful to be here. Thank you for your great questions. And thank you.